right. So, um, why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and um, a little bit about your background. My name is Afaf Stevens. Uh, I grew up in Baghdad, Iraq, and I have been here for almost 30 years, 29 years, 30 years. Uh, I got married here, I raised two children here, but I have a big family in Iraq, Baghdad. Um, most of them, however, left Iraq, but I still have a few members, my brothers and uh, their families, my cousins, my relatives, and my friends. Um, I still have them there. Uh, I am an educator, a public speaker, and I am a mother and a wife. <laughs> so this is who I am. <laughs> so what is it um, that you are trying to achieve in your public speaking? I ob observed a long time ago that there is some kind of a gap between East and West, uh, whether Eastern civilization and Western civilization, Eastern ideology and Western ideology. Uh, between the perspectives, the perceptions, uh, there's a differences between East and West, how they see each other. Um, this misperception and um, misunderstanding led into several conflicts uh, and crises uh, all along this past 30 years I've been here, but even before that there was also all these conflicts and crises. And so finally I felt there's tremendous gap, and I feel I can contribute to bridge that gap through understanding. So to me, knowledge and understanding is absolutely the first and foremost step we need to undertake in order to bridge that gap and to bring these two cultures, civilizations, traditions together so that they can learn how to live in peace and harmony. But this peace has to be based on understanding and justice. Okay, and part of that understanding that you were talking about this morning, uh, you mentioned that uh, there's four stages to listening, acknowledging, recognizing. Can you talk about the different um, stages? And, and I want to also add that uh, if I may ask you to uh, repeat it um, in condensed form, but you can just re respond to the question, and if I stop you and say, can you say that again in, in, uh, in a shorter time? Well, you know, I feel... The this is almost like a, a pre a pre any conflict resolution is to try to diagnose what are these problems and how to go about it. I feel it is um, fundamentally is to first of first and foremost is to listen to the grievances and to listen to those feelings where it's coming from. What is all about? So listening is extremely crucial. Rather than me imposing my perception on you, I need to listen to you first to see what do you have to say and what do you feel? How do you feel? And then acknowledging what you have to say, acknowledging, recognizing your feelings. That is also another step very, very important for conflict resolution. Because if I deny your feelings, if I deny your feelings of conflict, of grievances, of pain, uh, of feeling being oppressed or wronged, uh, then there is no conflict resolution uh, take place uh, under any circumstances if I already deny your uh, right to express that and how you feel. And then, you know, later it comes uh, the, uh, the important step also is validation, to validate what you have to offer, what you have, what you feel, how do you feel, what you have to say. This is very, very crucial element in conflict resolution. Once I validate what you have, that makes it much easier for me to understand your viewpoint, your perspective, and then it will be easier for both of us to arrive at a conflict resolution where it is fair and just for both of us, you know. Okay. And, um I'm going to ask you to maybe pick a sentence for, like, we need to listen to each other, we need to acknowledge this, and we need to uh, recognize them, and then we need to validate this. So four sentences, you know, how would you summarize the pathway to conflict resolution with those four elements? Uh, um, let's, let's take it in particular between East and West, between the Western uh, people and the Eastern people, the Middle East. Uh, let's say... Why this explosiveness going on? Why this crisis going on? 
and let's say we got together with them on the table of negotiation. And if they say, we've been feeling that we have been wronged in all these aspects in our life. So when we, when we listen to those aspects, what are those aspects? And then we understand how do they feel about them. If there is pain and suffering and anger and resentment and even the stage of desperation, uh, level of despair, then we have to acknowledge all these feelings and validate that. And by acknowledging that and say, now let's talk about how do we get out of the situation? How do we redeem the situation? How do we correct that? And then we have to come to a solution or resolution where it fits both sides by negotiation. And that, this level reached a level where the grief level uh, part, you know, they feel now I have a listening ears. Now, whatever the outcome will be, it will be fair and just because it's based on understanding, based on listening. And that's very crucial, it's very cru crucial. If they listen to all these causes and of crisis and factors of contention between East and West, and if they internalize it in depth with respect and understanding, that would make the resolution much, much simpler, easier, and much more concrete resolution to bring peace between both uh, civilizations, um, so. Okay, um, what I wanna do is take all those thoughts and reduce them into like a, one segment because it's uh, since I'm not an author, I can't pick and choose. I have to ask be linear. So if you take the uh, listen, acknowledge, recognize, and validate all four of those elements and just do a, a quick summary. Like you know, because they, with media, you have to get a very quick sound bite. You can only have something that's like maybe two or three sentences long right. in order for to sort of edit stuff together. So, so if you try to do a minute it, summary of, of all those, uh, all those concepts. Can you give an example of what you so, want the sentence to sound like? In order to move forward, we need to listen to the problems of the Middle East. We need to acknowledge that there are grievances. We need to recognize, you know, something on that lines. Uh, yes, in, in, order to, in order to arrive at a long last just peace, um, you know, we have to listen to the issues of contention, we have to recognize them, and we have to validate them, and validate the feelings behind them. And we have to accept the negotiation to be based on the solution coming from both partners, what it is fair to both parties. So the solution has to come out of the, as an outcome of the negotiation after listening, recognizing, acknowledging, validate, validating the issues, the crisis, then the outcome would be fair to both parties. That's great. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, I just want to talk about, um, you know, that you mentioned that, you know, there is no good or bad. And I think maybe that in a, in a Christian society, we, we sometimes we, we term, tend to term things as good or bad and that you know, in, in your speech this morning, you're talking about all of humanity and that it's not, it's not, we're all one in a way, so. Well, absolutely there is no good and bad in humanity. Uh, human, human society, it's one big global family. They evolved through millions of years. Humanity, human race, human family went through the uh, adult, not even the childhood infancy, and then the uh, toddlerhood, uh, you know, that is the hunting, um, you know, the gathering and the hunting, and, and then you have the uh, adolescence, peri-adolescence, that is with all the turmoils and turbulence and upheavals and confusions, and trying out every philosophy, every ideology on the other, one on the other, the philosophies, the clashes of opinions. These are all the teenage time and the turbulent stage. And now humanity as a human race is ushering the stage of maturity. That is a human collectively. This is not only one continent or one race or one religion. It is the human collective society emerging into a global, uh, more matured, more conscientious, 
of their own rights, of the human rights, of their nature, environment rights. And this is a level of maturation of the human race. So the, there is no bad and no good. There, it's all humanity. They have the potentialities to be incredibly creative, peace-loving, uh, uh, harmoniously building their own society, the global society in the world. Most of the bad, what we call bad, it is for the lack of the opportunities. Most of the bad actions coming as a result of long, long time of oppression, being su subjected to oppressive environment. When we oppress one another, when we oppress others, whether children or uh, adults, they will never be able to fulfill their potentialities which it is meant to be for them. They will um, skip it and it will be inverted into negativities. That energy, that creative power, that uh, potentialities, it will be uh, twisted, uh, it will be uh, directed and uh, into negative outcomes, it outlets. So people will be um, angry, uh, violent, uh, vengeful. That's why we have problems in the whole societies in the world, including our society in the United States. We have the children, we have the teenagers, those who are lacking opportunities. We see them definitely, they turn into drugs and alcohol and violence. And most of them, they end up in jail for life, uh, death sentence, or destructive style life, you know and there's all these uh, problems. Um, so it is 90, maybe 95% of the causes, these are socio-economic political causes. And these are the uh, suppressive causes to suppress the environment and to, to uh, subject the people to become totally what we call bad. Bad is really is the result, the consequence of the causes. We have to address the causes. Then we, we remove 99% of the bad. Uh, so, you know, instead of having 100 criminals or 100 delinquents, uh, you know, uh, teenagers, we will have maybe one or even none maybe in some cases. If we have the environment, the support, the love, the nurturing, the fairness, the justice, the education, um, these are all uh, prerequisites factors for a peaceful, successful society. So these are crucial um, elements for a peaceful society in the world. Okay, and, and some people in America would say that you know Saddam Hussein was oppressive to his society, and, and he we needed to go over there and depose of him. What what do, what do you say to that? Absolutely. Okay, hold the, on. When, he, absolutely. When you have to repeat, um, since I'm not going to be including my. Yes, um, I mean, uh, yes, you definitely. Would, you would want to say Saddam Hussein and then start the sentences of the right. sentence. Sorry. Uh, Saddam Hussein was a tyrant, uh, you know, a very oppressive tyrant ruler in the world. And that is very, very clear, no any doubt about it. What it needed to, needed to be done about it, it's his own people take him to the UN themselves. Take him to the upper authoritative institution with full authority to bring him into justice in one way or another. It doesn't matter how that is. Uh, yes, they, they exercised in the UN institutions, in the international institutions, there were um, incidences when they brought people into justice. You know, the Lunenburg, what, what do you call it, the trials um, of the Nazis, they executed them even. So he needed to be brought to justice. Uh, if we put uh, enough pressure on these institutions to do their own work in the right way, it, w it should have been done, definitely. Um, that is for, uh, we agree. Um, I agree Saddam was a tyrant, for sure, uh, yes. So I guess a lot of people would say that um, the Iraqi people could not do that because they would be killed. I mean, yes, they tried all uh, many, many ways, and they were not successful. But okay, who tried? The the Iraqi people they tried many, many times to bring him to justice. They couldn't, and that's uh, definitely because he was extremely ruthless leader. Uh, that's for sure. But the fact that not only Iraqi people, the other people of the world, they felt the moral duty for them to go and support them and help them they should have done enough pressure to the UN to take their own 
action in their own uh, ways according to the international law. And there are uh, provisions in the international law as to how to prevent uh, tyrannical institutions to be inflicting, inflicting pain so much on their own people to be brought to justice and to be brought to an end. So there are these provisions, and it should have been done in that level, in that way, definitely. Um, he should have been brought to justice, definitely. Um, I came for years, years ago, and I told the Justice Department why I left, what are those reasons, and no action was taken. Uh, it turned out uh, they take certain countries to the United Nations and put pressure on them, and they don't put pressure on the other countries for political reasons. And that is, you know, that's very, um, very wrong. Uh, you so know. you went to the Justice Department in the 60s or 70s and told them In the this? early 70s, yes. So can you say, like, in the 1970s, I went to the Justice Na Department? Yeah. In 1974, I went to the immigration. I explained to them why I don't want to go back uh, to the country, um, to my country, to Iraq, and I explained to them in full details. And they didn't take any action except, yes, they allowed me, and I am thankful for that. But I felt guilty because I left my family to be subject to suffering also. And when I asked them, they said, well, it's none of our business to interfere in, in Iraq uh, affairs. And then I, I soon came to know that they were able to take action in many other parts of the countries when they wanted for, for political purposes. But at that point, it wasn't in their interest to take action, and therefore they didn't take action. So they allowed things to be perpetuated and um, even uh, um, expand and all these, you know, um, violence and all these things to take place. So why did the United States go to war in Iraq? Uh, was it to liberate the people of Iraq? That's what they think. I mean, that's why okay. what so they said. Exactly. Uh, United States, they felt that they have to go. They felt that this is their moral duty to go and to liberate Iraq and to bring uh, democracy and freedom. And I feel personally uh, these things it should be taken by international institutions because these conflicts, when it happens on that international level, I believe there is no one single country has a right to do to take any action towards another country at all, um, uh, you know, unilaterally, you know, because these things it has to go to international institutions, and to me that is the United Nations, and that was the only institution should have resolved the conflict in any way they feel fit. It doesn't matter how, you know. So that's how I feel. Okay, and today you talked about the four prerequisites to peace. What are those? And kind of explain. And quickly, or in, in a, a kind of in a summary. Uh, you mean about the factors the, of uh, the, yeah, the, the spiritual, spiritual cultural yeah. Cult. Um, these are the specific prerequisites for peace between uh, East and West, definitely. Uh, these are the East feel they have, they feel they have been oppressed by the West in all these areas, rather only in one area, because most of the Western people, if they tell them, you know, we feel oppressed, they say, oh, they are talking about economics. They talk about oil. They talk about, and we haven't done anything. There's a free economy. There's exchange in a free world, you know, and we buy their goods for cheap because that's how it is in the free world economy. But the people in the East, they feel they have been oppressed in many, many other areas which are much more painful even than the economic um, oppression. Even economic oppression is painful enough to lead to violence. And it is leading to violence in many, many parts of the world, uh, economic oppressions. But unfortunately, it is not only economic oppression, but there are many, many other areas people, they've, they've been feeling oppressed by all these other areas, that is, we have even more painful than economic oppression, we have the spiritual oppression. We have the social political oppression, we have cultural oppression. These are much more painful than economic oppression even. Even though we agreed now, or I said, uh, I claim that economic op oppression itself alone can lead to violence uh, and it can disturb the stability of the human society in the world uh, and it can uh, disturb peace in the world also, definitely. And yet I feel the spiritual oppression and the cultural oppression are even more painful to the people. Very, very painful. You, 
I feel it is better to even physical death even easier because physical death inflict pain instantly. But when you have cultural and spiritual oppression, you are subjecting them to an ongoing pain and suffering. And there is a limitation for the human capacity to take it and to bear. They reach a level where they cannot take it anymore. They reach a level where they reach the desperation and the hopelessness. And once they reach that level of desperation, of hopelessness, they can commit any act of terrorism and violence. And many, many scholars in the medical field and psychological field, m many professors um, from the psychology departments or any other departments, they brought even professional psychiatrists they, to talk about the issues in, in Iraq. Why these, uh, you know, like what you call suicide bombers and things like that. And they analyze it. They said it. They said if a human spirit reach a level of desperation or despair, it doesn't matter to the individual anymore, life or death. And therefore, it, it, it doesn't matter to them if they commit an act of uh, uh, blowing themselves in the car um, with bombs or any other act of terrorism. You know, so these are psychological consequences of uh, crushing uh, the spirit of humanity. So we can commit an act of violence against the human spirit, spiritually and culturally, by denoun denouncing their rights in the world and in the human civilization. And that's what leads to explosiveness. Hmm. That's great. Um, yeah. You have to define what, how that's happened. Because yeah, how? What is spiritual? OK, um, so can you? How has the United States done that? Yeah, can you give me um, an example of uh, before these, this latest Iraq, Iraq war, and maybe even after, uh, specifics of um, the spiritual and cultural violence and oppression from the West? Yes, the West have been uh, truthfully... Um, okay, um, I just, uh, just want to get this. Okay, go ahead. The, the, West, the West have wronged East, um, you know, for even centuries, not only decades, for centuries for sure, uh, spiritually and culturally. Eventually, uh, I mean, lately, then they, there's the economical oppression and po socio-political oppression also. But the spiritual cultural oppression, it has been going on for a while in many, many very, very severely painful ways. First of all, by um, not validating and acknowledging uh, their spiritual heritage, their spiritual entity and identity. Who are those people of Middle East? What is their spirituality? What is their uh, conviction? What is their traditions? What do they have to offer so that we understand them? I cannot communicate with you as a friend unless I understand you, unless I know you. Who you are, what's your background, where were you born, uh, what's your ideology, what's your philosophy? Uh, obviously, your ideology, your philosophy, in one way or another, it is, is spiritually also influenced. Whether you are anti-certain things or you are pro-certain things, it's all springing from our human spirit. Or you are, um, you know, uh, what do you call, passionate about certain things. And once I get to know you, then I really understand you, and I know how to relate to you, and I know how to communicate with you. And then I know how to build a relationship and friendship in a positive way, an and enduring, peaceful relationship. And yet, the West denied the validity of anything they have to people to offer, specifically their spirituality, specifically their religion. The West opposed Islam in a most, most unfair ways uh, by the writings in a very, very vehement, negative um, uh, literature. The books are millions of books, thousands of books for hundreds of years. And when I read them, I get so bewildered. I get so shocked. I say, why did, do they do that? <laughs> there is a religion which it is really great religion. It came to humankind. It um, offered us such incredible spur of progress and advancement in the human history and a human civilization. Not any fair-minded human being, whether a scholar or layman or um, you know, um, leader or thinker, can deny that. Um, if they look with fairness into what is Islam, what it had uh, to bring to humanity, and what is its contribution to the progress of humanity, to the sciences, to the knowledge, to 
the literature to whatever discipline may be of the civilization, you know. And yet um, the West denied that, although, <laughs> uh, which is really so ironically and so, um, really it's just to me, I, I cannot understand it, that every single element of the Western civilization so well concretely built upon the science and knowledge and uh, the elements of understanding came through Islam and brought through Islam into the Western world, into Europe. For centuries and centuries, there was whether Spain or France or Southern uh, or Italy, the entire Southern Europe became a magnificent basin or matrix for uh, blending of civilizations and knowledge. At that time, people, they flocked from Northern Europe, came into the South specifically to learn, and they spent 20 years, 30 years, 40 years just to learn and go up to the back to Northern European countries, and they brought the art, the beauty, the architecture, the cathedrals, they brought medicine, they brought social equity, they brought hygiene, they brought um, uh, uh, poetry, knowledge, they brought everything, the schools, the first university ever was established, it was in Spain. The first medical universe, um, college or medical school or the first hospital, the first paved roads, the first lit roads with lights at night, it was in Southern Europe, it was in Spain. The largest houses of learning and scholarship and investigation and research was in Spain. It was all brought by those great Muslim scholars, scientists, philosophers, theologians, you know. And when the only thing I hear about is remained in the mind of the Western people, they say, oh, those are the Moors. I didn't even know the word Moors, what is it? And it turned out the only image re remained in their mind, in their subconscious is, there were savage people who came with the sword and they wo fought with them, and those were the Northern African Moors. And I, let me, let me uh, segue and, and uh, focus, refocus it in, into the uh, system of American e education and, and how um, it's skewed, and, and your perception of, of why is there's a misunderstanding from the perspective of, what, of the current state of the education here in America. Uh, absolutely, uh, I mean, I feel this is the unfairness, what I am talking about. This is the, uh, whether it is intentional or, or unintentional, it is very, very, very unfair to let our children in the West and in America specifically to grow up not, not knowing whatsoever uh, who brought what to world civilization or who contributed to his, to his and her civilization, which they are enjoying the fruits of. And yet um, I was teaching in one of the classes in high school and I was saying, um, Yes, algebra, it, it, you know, many, many disciplines of sciences were either brought uh, purely from Islamic Arabic world or it was a blend um, between the East and the West knowledge from the Greek, from the Persians, from the Indians, uh, from China. They brought it all to Baghdad for five, six centuries and they blended all these things and they modified them, they made them disciplines, organized them, codified them, they brought them to the West. And then when I said, when I said algebra is one of the Arabic pure disciplines brought from the Arab world, from Muslim world, and they laughed. They said, get out of here. I said, I'm telling you the word algebra is Arabic word even, you know, let alone physics and geography and all these words. They said, no. I said, open the encyclopedia and read. So they opened it and they laughed. They said, huh, she said it's from Iraq. I said, algebra came from Iraq. And they said, are you, we are reading the encyclopedia. I said, can you read it loud? And I felt, God, did I make a mistake? What happens? How, how did encyclopedia twist in the knowledge? How can they twist the science, you know? <laughs> so they read it. He, I said, read it out loud. Let me just, yeah, I just want to focus it on, on also the, the television news media as a form of education and, and comment on how you see the, the television news within America and how it, 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 it discourages a lot of these viewpoints that you're talking about, or at least your perception on the news media as a form of how it informs people. I think the news media, most unfortunately, in the last few years, um, let's just forget about in the last 50 or, or to 100 years in, in America or in the West, but at least recently in the last 10, 15 years, since the Gulf War up to now, 
uh, they've been uh, so themselves I, I consider it uninformed at all. And beside, also, they reinforce the misconceptions, the stereotyping, the misunderstanding. They reinforce these uh, misperceptions um, into the public back again uh, with even almost like, hey, we are proving what we understand now. These are a bunch of savages because then they go to Iraq and then they take a picture of children playing in the mud. Well, in the mud be uh, or in the sewer dirt flowing in the streets. Well, is this really that's their origin? Is that their nature? Or this is because of the destruction has been happening in the last 30 years, in one way or another, because of the violence and crisis and wars and uh, the boycott and all these things? So these are the consequences, and then they take it as to prove their point of their own misconceptions of the people of the Middle East. And to me, this is just... Uh, <laughs> so yeah, let me just have you summarize that um, the journalists are informed, and then therefore they propagate their, their ignorance in a way. So if you just summarize that thought in a... I believe that journalism uh, recently have not lived up to their own purpose of promoting knowledge, understanding, education to the public, to the people. That's what I thought their purpose it should be. Because the, uh, media and journalism, it is one of the great tools for education. And education should be neutral, liberal, fair, and it should be scientific. What I mean by the word scientific is that you cannot um, spread any information unless it is well thoroughly scientifically investigated. And unless we give a scientific facts rather than we reinforce the specific ideas for specific political intentions or specific political agenda or something like that by reinforcing points of ignorance of, uh, you know, of what is the actual fact is, uh, the, what is happening uh, in the East or who are the people of the Middle East, uh, you know. So. Yep. Um, okay, that was good, that's real good. Um, let's see, the, you talked about um, uh, this, this chain of events um, that you, you mentioned, the kind of like the ignorance of the culture breeds mistrust, breeds suspicion, breeds fear, breeds insecurity, crisis, and conflict. Can you talk about that, that path? I think if, we, if, if the West would continue the same pattern of relationship with the East, and that is the lack of understanding, the lack of knowledge, that means they don't know them. And if they don't know them, that means they don't trust them. If the West doesn't trust the Middle East, the West will suspect there will be suspicion between East and West. If there is suspicion, then there's fear. Then the Western people will fear the people of the East. And if there's fear, there is um, insecurity. And if there is insecurity, once you are insecure, then you will say, how am I going to restore my feeling of security? I want to feel secured. Then there was obstacle in my way to make me feel secured. And I need to remove that obstacle. And by that desire to remove that obstacle of feeling insecure, that is the crisis of conflict and violence. That is the act of violence, because that's the beginning of crisis. Uh, because you are going to take any action you feel fit to remove that obstacle for you. So in order for you to feel secured all over again, and that's not the way really we go to resolve issues. Uh, uh, we have to reverse the whole actions of the, these steps. We need to know them. We need to trust them and we need to feel secured with them. And then we need to respect them and deal with them in their own terms as well, not only on our own terms also only, you know, because that's, then there will be no fairness. And then we need to resolve issues coming from both sides equally. So it's the mutual respect and understanding. These are so crucial elements. It's the mutual respect and understanding. And most of these recent negotiations in the last maybe 100, 150 years has been going unilaterally because only one part, one side goes to say, I understand the conflict, this is the conflict, this is, therefore, this is the solution. And there is no way on earth we are going to have peace or secured peace or lasting peace based on one-sided solution coming from one perspective from one perception and nothing else. That's in itself um, 
it's like a what do you call a peace built built on sand. You know, you can't build peace on sand. The sand will just shake for the slightest uh, uh, wind or <laughs> waves uh, of water or something. It will collapse. I think that's a it's a really important uh, chain of events, and I just want to have you go through that chain one more time because I want to make sure that I, I want to have it nice and clear. Yeah, so this the, is um, the uh, the uh, the ignorance, the mistrust, the suspicion. Yeah, so I just go through it that yeah. that chain one more time. The ones we do not know, we do not trust. The ones we do not trust, we suspect. And once we have suspicion, then we fear those people. And now once we've, like, let's say I moved to a neighborhood and people, they don't know me, then they don't trust me. And instead of then getting to know me, then they mistrust me. And instead of removing that mistrust, then they f fear me. If they fear me, and instead of solving it, getting to know me so that they don't fear me, then they feel also insecure because then they consider me I am obstacle in their security feeling. And in order to remove that feeling of uh, insecurity, they will have to do everything in their power to remove me from the way of feeling secured. So they kick me out of the neighborhood in every possible way so that they feel secure, so they close their eyes in peace. That's really not a true peace because there will be feeling of pain and gap of darkness of not knowing what was going on, what is happening. The darkness of feeling, did I get to know them? Did I give them chance? Maybe they were nice neighbors. Maybe they would help me. Maybe I would help them. Maybe we would exchange. Maybe they would enrich me. I would enrich them. And that gap in itself is darkness of ignorance. And that in itself, it doesn't help their potentialities to be fulfilled themselves. So, you know. Okay, yeah, let me, that, I got some good stuff out of that. And I want to I wanna get the whole chain from the beginning all the way up to the, the crisis and conflict, beginning with the, uh, you know, the uninformed or the, the ignorance of the culture in a way. So if you could just go through that whole chain. From yeah, the if the West... If the West doesn't know the culture, the traditions, the spirituality, the socioeconomic political history of the East, then they don't know them. If they don't know them, they will mistrust them because they don't know them. You can't trust somebody if you don't know. You have to get to know them first, then you trust them. And if they mistrust them, there will be suspicion always. They will fear them. They will anticipate things which is not real because that is the psychological. The fear and the insecurity, it is a primitive emotions of a human being uncontrolled by cognition. It is a coming from our uh, uh, primitive, even part of the brain, truthfully. The cognition coming from the um, uh, neocortex, which it is really recently, it was developed as we cognitively developed. And the cognition control the emotion by getting to know others. Then they control the emotions. But if we fear and have insecure, we act impulsively, instinctually. Then we become primitive like animals because then we have no cognitive understanding because then I attack that neighbor and I kick them out because I don't know them. And I didn't use the process of cognition. It's the same thing. The, East, the West refused to get to know the East and then they don't trust them, then they have suspicion, then they have fear, then they have insecurity, and these are all lowering our cognition. It take us all to the primitive survival savage stages of human nature. These are the lower nature, you know, and we shouldn't allow that to happen because we are educated people, we are educated, and you know, that's the lack of education. It makes us to behave like, um, uncivilized, primitive human being. And the West, by refusing to get to know the East, and by refusing to get, understand them and trust them, that will lead into the, uh, finally, eventually, they are always insecure about them, they are always suspecting them, and therefore they will try even, in one way or another, to suppress them, get rid of them in every possible way, so that they can feel secured. So they, there are a bunch of bad guys there. We go, we kill them so we can feel secured. That's another way to solve issues, to solve problems whatsoever. Um, you know, because you cannot get rid of two people and you say, oh, there will be peace in the world. 
How can this happen? <laughs> there are long stages for enduring peace, a lasting peace. Uh, it has to be, and all these things, what I call, uh, you know, uh, fundamental uh, principles uh, for prerequisites for a lasting peace. We need to address those prerequisite issues and factors in order to resolve conflicts. Uh, we have to address them seriously and sincerely, uh, you know. Can you, okay. uh, can you give me kind of an idea from the perspective of, uh, from within Iraq, of kind of the current events in, our, in, in the war, like, uh, well, uh, like maybe you know, give me some insight from what people that are within Iraq are saying? Um, I think most of them, in one sense... Okay, hold on. Most, most when you say the them, most, the, the people in Iraq, um, in one sense, they did want and they do want to get rid of oppressive uh, tyrannical system. That's no doubt about it. They wanted to get rid of Saddam and his regime because it was oppressive regime, tyrannical regime. That's for sure. And they wanted the world to help them. But they didn't want to have a specific country to come and help them. When America alone went to help them, then they felt immediately the same suspicions. Now it reversed its case because then they became suspicious of the intention of the American people. Then they started to feel, is this uh, economically, uh, you know, based uh, operation? Is this um, for their own interest? Um, is this uh, because of the oil uh, resources? At this point, they are almost confirming their suspicions because at this point they feel they still they don't have jobs, they, they still have no electricity, they still they don't have much water, uh, clean water, and there is no opportunities um, of the young generation. So all the young generations, there is still they have frustration, and they have anger, they have resentment, they see America somehow in charge of everything. They see, they see them that, that they want to control everything, and they feel uh, very insecure themselves now. Because then they feel, oh, America came to stay for a long time because of our oil. Uh, America came uh, to stay because of their own interests, economical interests. And there's no any opportunities for them left for them to grow and prosper and, and flourish and restore their dignity, which was crushed totally during the tyrannical regime. And now they feel another people are coming to crush their dignity and they feel angry and frustrated because it is not properly addressed all these issues, how to bring restoration into Iraq, how to bring peace into Iraq, how to even uh, redress the uh, social tyranny uh, that happened in Iraq. This it ha it should have been all resolved through United Nations agencies, and it was their job. It, the feelings of the Iraqi people would be totally different, uh, totally. Their uh, reactions, their feelings, their um, their, uh, their entire um, understanding as their identity will be restored and respected and their dignity will be res restored and respected by United Nations agencies and institutions rather than America can, uh, alone because they perceive America as to be politically, uh, you know, kind of like what you call um, politically uh, inspired to go and do these operations and then therefore they will, they will they feel their dignity again, it is crushed all over again by another people, uh, you know. So it's like they are replacing, uh, you know, oppressive regime by another oppressive forces. That's how they see it themselves. And they are angry and they are frustrated, um, you know. What about the uh, kind of the, the psychological impact or the physical impact of the war? What these are the devastation. Any kind of, you know, uh, war, no matter how, even in the name of peace and name of democracy, we carry war, it, has, it is devastating, no matter what. Uh, there is devastation, there is physical devastation, there is psychological devastations, there are children chopped their hands or legs and, or died. Uh, there is the chemicals of the uranium, whatever, it is being used in these uh, bombs and things like that. Uh, the cancer rate um, spreading beyond anything among the children, even even infants. 
defects, birth defects. Uh, there is unbelievable devastation. And, you know, also li like even the destruction of sociocultural um, uh, traditions of the country of Iraq, even by going and establishing 60, 70 McDonald's in the country, replacing their beautiful style of living, of eating, of healthy, simple food, replacing everything into the fast food the, uh, or skyscrapers continuously or all this, what we call modernity or modernization, uh, they perceive it as to be uh, a neo-colonialism or neo-imperialism, they call it. Uh, they say this is not modernity, this is uh, bringing, bringing materialism, bringing up exploitation, changing our system, changing our culture abruptly, changing of our socio-economic political um, traditions, uh, without being even asked for or prepared for or when you when we impose things on others people resent it naturally even if it is good for them if you leave them alone and you don't oppress them they will grow and flourish and they will exchange they will come to you they will tell you hey come and build McDonald's and that's okay if they come to you to ask you to build for them McDonald's but you go all the way there and you say this is the only way for you because we want to civilize you we want to educate you. This is the only way is good for you. McDonald is the only way is good for you. And so this is imposition. We can't impose civilization on others. When you remove oppression, human, human being naturally, innately, they are progressive by nature. They will seek their own progress on their own pace and their own style. And there's nothing with their, wrong with their style. It's very beautiful. It breaks my heart to see that the, the culture being crushed or being changed or being transformed or being imposed upon differently. I love the style. I love, actually, when I came here in the last 30 years, I always used to feel, I say, oh, I wish we exchange and we understand one another's gifts and uniqueness. There's so much East can offer to the West, even simple things socially. You know, I sit alone in the evening and I say, gosh, if I'm in Baghdad, am I alone in the evening? There will be 10 different, the sweetest friends to my heart, the de dearest and nearest to my heart, uh, opening the door uh, or um, giving me phone call or just stopping, do you need anything or how are you doing? And, and we would have laughters and joy and fun. And, you know, and, and to me, this is lacking and missing in the uh, uh, rat race, um, uh, you know, culture here in the West. Everybody is so busy. They have no time for socialization, for fun, for joy, for, you know, or even if they want to say, well, but we socialize only with people like us. Is this really healthy also? Because we socialized in Baghdad with everybody with every, from wherever they come from. So uh, nobody wants to socialize with me. Oh, because you are from Iraq. We don't want to socialize with, with you because you are uncivilized. We didn't say that with, with, with people when they came from different parts of the world uh, to Iraq to live. We used to socialize with them with utmost fun and joy and respect and a mutual exchange, you know. So in either way, I'm saying there is numerous gifts the Eastern culture can offer to the West, you know rather than only they have nothing, we want to offer to them everything. Um, we are missing a lot by not understanding them, by not knowing who they are, what's their culture. We are missing a lot uh, in our life here, for sure. Great, right. I see just uh, three minutes. Three minutes, okay. Um, let me just, uh, the, can you talk a little bit about um, a perception, or maybe it's a misperception, you know, probably a misperception, that um, that the Iraqi women are a, a, a lot better off if there was a lot of oppression or they weren't free to think or, or can you talk about that and I think this is an, an issue that you may have talked about yesterday when I wasn't there but Jenna mentioned I think in the media that American um, Americans think that um, women are being um, oppressed they're being liberated they're but, um, that women from the East are very oppressed and that mm -hmm. we are liberating them into feminism or maybe into having equal rights. Do the women feel liberated by America? Um, in general, I mean, women in Middle East, they used to enjoy a lot of rights and provisions where it was not existed in the West at all. Uh, the, the slightest example I can give you, women used to own properties and sign deeds and invest money 
and sell and buy and inherit and leave to her heirs all on her own identity, legal identity, independently from the seventh century on. All these provisions never was given to the Western women until the 19th century. So there was 1300 years ahead of them. The Eastern women enjoyed all these provisions, all these rights, almost 1300 years ahead of the Western women, that's for sure. So even the women liberation here is definitely well based or rooted, deeply rooted uh, in the Islamic uh, civilization uh, from centuries back. That's how they take it, they took it and that's how they took off with it from in the West. But recently, many, many scholars, including Western scholars, they wrote about effect um, against psychological theory, which is really uh, a, a scientific uh, premise, and that is when societies, communities, they become oppressed, they turn internally, they invert their pain and suffering, and they become oppressors themselves to their weaker kind. So they become um, extremist, they become militant, they become fundamentalist, they turn against their women, their children. So there was a setback movement in the last few decades uh, as a result um, against their own women, the, against their own children. Um, they became fundamentalist, they became sexist, they became chauvinist, much more than what I grew up with. Now when I see the images, even about Iraq, even about Baghdad, there's no way in the world I can believe this is really happening in Baghdad because that's not what, where I grew up. I wish I brought my family pictures. My, fa my mother and my grandmother and my aunts from both sides, my father's side, my mother's side, I will show you their pictures. You will say, that's really, it's impossible coming from Baghdad in the 1920s, in the 19, you know, right to the, to the turn of the century. Those pictures, when you see them, the, it shows you like almost in the 50s and the 60s in Hollywood, you know, the real, real elite of the American society. And yet those are middle class average people. They were absolutely advanced, absolutely well educated, well enjoyed their freedom and uh, liberty and education and all these things. Uh, but in the last few decades, there's tremendous setback and um, the male, Middle Eastern oppressed male inverted and internalized their pain and suffering because they could not take it on the West. They took it on their families, on their children. They became extremist, fundamentalist. They became military. You're, you're talking about, you know, a lot of these issues are very, you know, it's it's very hard to, to condense issues. I mean, we are talking about uh, so deeply uh, ingrained. Um, frictions and contentions between East and West for centuries. Uh, it is so serious, um, it is so painful, it is causing suffering and pain and leading to crisis and conflicts. And it's fair enough to the people in the West to really stop and just stop. Let's understand what's going on. What has been happening between East and West and why? Why? What is going on? Is it really naturally people being born, suddenly they come to the world one day old, they say, I hate the West. I hate America. You know? I mean, why is this happening? Uh, people usually, they grow up normal. They want to have peace, security, uh, prosperity, justice, safety. These are all human universal elements, uh, principles that we can survive without. So when they grow up in atmosphere full of um, regimes supposed to be being brought by the West and installed upon the countries to serve the interests of the Western world rather than the people of those countries, and those people of those countries, they remained um, with lack of opportunities, lack of education, being exploited, they feel being wronged, being oppressed, being imposed upon. Uh, even the modernity in Iran was imposed upon them by the West, and that led to tremendous explosiveness, whether in the turn of the century, then in the 50s, then in the 70s all over again. Uh, so it is really, it's not a matter of one single spot in one single place in the world. It's really a matter of continuous, this pattern of behavior of the West being 
uh, unfair treating the people of the world and the people of the Middle East in particular also. It's been an ongoing for at least uh, two, three centuries, if not even more. And people are reaching their level of uh, exhaustion. Now they say, well, they didn't want to listen to us. They didn't want to get to know us. They didn't want to respect us. They didn't want to trust us. Now we cannot take it anymore. Now we are taking it into a level of crisis and violence. These are all psychological stages human nature go through. If I oppress you and I take your opportunities, you will be in the beginning patient and waiting for the opportunities or for the wronging to be redressed. And if there is no way in the, in the end, you become hopeless, you become in despair, and then you become eventually violent no matter what, uh, because you cannot take it anymore. That's the human psychology. We go back into our primitive ways. We, we, sur we become survivals by fighting for our rights, and it shouldn't be so. Uh, we don't need to do that. We don't need to fight for our rights. It needs to be God's given rights. Um, everybody wants to feel secured and happy and respected, uh, well uh, acknowledged, well recognized. Uh, if you don't recognize their existence, if you don't respect their culture, their heritage, their gifts and contributions, you already uh, eliminated their identity, you already crushed their spirit. You already denounced their right of existence for who they are. And that is the most painful, the most absolute painful stage human being can go through uh, by not recognizing them, them, not respecting them, not validating who they are, what do they have to offer, and how do we exchange with them on a mutual respect and understanding. Uh, and that's how it should be basic human relationship based an, on a mutual understanding and respect. Uh, not um, only I impose my identity on you, my culture on you, my tradition on you, and my economical uh, philosophy on you, uh, and this is how I should do it. Um, I need to get the most out of you uh, based on exploitation and my own self-interest and my own, uh, whether greed or whatever, uh, you know, my own agenda. It should be on what do you need, what I need, who are you, who am I, and how do we exchange and how do we live, uh, you know, with mutual respect and mutual understanding. Uh, how do we share, how do we celebrate one another? And that's the real um, ultimate, uh, you know, goal for human civilization is when we really celebrate one another's uniqueness, whether their culture, their race, their religion, their tradition, their spirituality, uh, their system, whatever that is. When we celebrate that, even though it is different from ours, that is the human civilization. Then we become really, truly civilized human being. So civilization is really understanding others. It's being civil. It's rather than how much I have and how much I can control you and conquer you and exploit you and take your rights. And that means I'm strong and I'm powerful, I'm in control. To me, I, call, I consider it, this is not civilization. To me, actually, this is a primitiveness and uh, savagery. You go back to the rule of the strength. We don't need that in the 21st centuries. We don't need the physical strength. We have the brain, we have technology, we have science. We can accomplish our incredible human spirit through the most peaceful and um, creative ways rather than uh, who's stronger, who can control who. That's really way outmoded. We outgrew that. It is obsolete. It's no longer a uh, valid uh, system whatsoever. Uh, and it has to be gone, bygone, long time ago. So we need to get away with it. <laughs> yeah. um, Great. That's real good. Yeah, I was going to ask you, you know, if the news media came to you during the buildup in the war in Iraq, what would would you have told them? I tried uh, to avoid that. Um, just because I didn't trust them. <laughs> I'm okay, sorry. Can, can you let... I didn't trust the media at that point because somehow. Okay, at, at, at what point? Uh, during the war. Okay, well, uh, uh, so, during so, the I'm war. Sorry. When you start, uh, just start over and, and be specific. The first sentence that you say, that, say the first sentence. Uh, no, you say it. No, I'm not going to. I'll let you all let her say it. So, okay. Just so that uh, try not to use any pronouns or just to be clear. Um, 
During the war, uh, the recent war between uh, in Iraq, I tried somehow to avoid the media. I somehow didn't trust them. Um, I felt they will um, not twist my viewpoints, but rather misinterpret my viewpoints or even um, ignore what's important to me. And what is what I was going to say, what is important to me, it's really truthfully what they don't want to hear. Um, and I already, they talked with me, some of them called me, and I told them that. And one of them, she was fair enough, and she understood that. I said, I think I have, what I have to tell you, you are not interested in. And this is what I am interested, I told her, in. Uh, more than uh, how do I feel about the invasion and, uh, of uh, against Saddam or not, or, or this is a good step or not. First, it is not, I feel it, is, it should go to the international institutions. And the other issues, it's much more important to my heart, uh, you know, the gap between, uh, the rift between East and West. And um, so she didn't come for an uh, interview. So I feel um, they are not now up to their mission, whatever that is, the, you know, media, uh, rather than they are more politically oriented. Um, and I don't enjoy that. Um, you know. So if it's, in other words, it's, you, you see that it's either the perspective of the Democrats or the Republicans, and unless it fits into that, it's not going to be heard? I think whatever the agenda on the, <laughs> whether on the market or on the, in the open air, they will follow that agenda at that point, whatever popular, whatever needs to be heard, rather than what is really important, what is really crucial to be heard. Uh, what is really necessary to be heard. These are parts of the truth. It has to be heard. And that's how I feel the ethic of journalism is when you feel there's a component needs to be heard as part of the truth, I feel it is your moral duty to bring it out. Uh, maybe you can put it in a form to be heard gently or um, what do you call uh, peacefully, and that's okay but not to bring it out because it serves a specific uh, political agenda, then you are not living up to your own uh, ethical principles, uh, you know. Uh, and that's what uh, disturbs me mostly with the media nowadays, uh, you know. Uh, I feel they are not living up to their ethical standard, uh, you know.